Welcome to the VAN PowerPoint presentation. We will go through multiple things during this lecture. More importantly, we will focus on patient outcomes because everything we do should be centralized around how the patients do. So why VAN? Well, VAN is a way to tell if someone is having a very large stroke. And we know stroke is the number one cause of disability. And large artery strokes are the most disabling. VAN allows us to identify these patients early and give the patients the best possible outcome by making sure that they are treated with TPA right away and then triage to endovascular suite for stroke thrombectomy. Stroke thrombectomy means pulling out the clot and it has been shown to increase the number of people that are functional uh, after a large stroke. So we'll be going through multiple things in this lecture. We'll talk about the new endovascular stroke trials and because um, that's very important. Uh, new triage and paradigm shift. What does VAN stand for? In short, it stands for cortical symptoms, which are vision, um, aphasia, and neglect. Aphasia, the inability to understand or to produce speech. Neglect, meaning you just neglect one side of the world. We'll go through the brain anatomy. We'll talk about the difference between large vessel stroke and small vessel stroke. We'll compare VAN to other large artery uh, stroke or large vessel occlusion tools. And we'll go over how to perform VAN. And finally, we'll go through some examples of uh, clot removal. Now, this is a long lecture, but this is to give you a perspective of why we're doing all this. If you want a short uh, presentation or video on how to perform VAN and how to score it, uh, this is also available on our site. So let's talk about endovascular treatment, right? Because VAN allows us to realize these patients likely have a clot so we can activate the team faster. So we can see if someone goes to an endovascular center and is offered endovascular treatment, their possibility of a good outcome goes from the one in blue is TPA only, the one in green is TPA plus endovascular treatment. It goes anywhere from 19 to 40 percent good outcomes all the way from 33 to 71 you can see that it nearly doubles the number of people that are functional if they are given the opportunity to go and have their clot pulled out through endovascular means. So after these five trials came out, the new standard of care, according to the American Stroke Association, is patients who are eligible for endovascular stroke treatment within 10 hours, sorry, within six hours, should be offered this. This is the same thing, just showing the p-value, the 95% confidence intervals, TPA alone versus endovascular plus TPA. Um, I put the slide in to allow you to look up the actual articles and to read them in detail yourself. They're all in the New England Journal of Medicine, all five articles. This was a meta-analysis, but it did not include a couple of these newer articles. So what do these trials tell us? Well, it tells us multiple things. One, we shouldn't be taking people to the endovascular suite unless we somehow know for sure that they have a clot. Because in the interventional management of stroke trial, IMS3, 18% of people didn't even have a clot. And if you're looking for an 18 to 20% difference and those patients that you're looking for a difference for don't even have a clot, you're not gonna show a difference. So everyone got a CT angiogram to confirm that there is a clot. Number two is the average time treatment is around four to four and a half hours. What does this mean? It means they moved in a parallel decision-making process to giving TPA as opposed to a series, meaning they didn't go, okay, CT, go back, start TPA, see how the patient does, go back for CTA, then activate the interventional team, then go back. 
you know, if you're going to do that, for most patients, they're not going to get treatment within four to four and a half hours or even within the six hour time window. And so this really forces us as a community to think about parallel processes as opposed to a series. So three studies went to six hours, one went to eight, and one went to 12. This basically means everyone within six hours who, who meets eligibility criteria should be offered endovascular treatment. How about advanced perfusion imaging? Well, only one and a half out of the five studies used advanced perfusion imaging. Most of the other studies just used the CTA or what's called a, a multi-phase CTA to look at collaterals. And some of the trials even re re reduced mortality. So these are the basic things when you read all the five endovascular stroke trials that we come away with. And I actually put this together even before the American Stroke Association guidelines came out. And it's very similar to what they had recommended as well. So I like to give you the big picture in, in, uh, or the lecture in one picture. So this is um, basically showing the number of people you need to treat to have one person that's independent from TPA from 0 to 3 hours, 3 to 4 and a half hours. Okay, here you can see it's 6 to 7 here and 13 to 14 here. Now we look at the endovascular stroke trials. Remember, this is endovascular with the TPA versus TPA alone. And even when you get TPA, you're still improving this much. So a number needs to treat 3, 4, 4, uh, close to 6, and 7, you know, which is very good in comparison to what we spend billions on, which is... Uh, going to the cath lab for ST elevation MIs, you need to treat 17 patients to make a difference. And then the difference is not just in pr preserving brain. No, it's if you combine brain plus stroke plus death, you still have to treat 17 patients to make a difference in one person's life. And this, again, I just like to be transparent. This is based off of the American Heart Association um, guidelines, which use this um, meta-analysis of 23 randomized trials and the absolute difference is 6%. Number needed to treat one over the absolute uh, risk reduction, which gives you the 16.7 number needed to treat for percutaneous MI. And this is how, and that's why the number needed to treat is so low here, because if you go back, look at this. We're talking about a 31% difference. That's massive in comparison to 6%, you know. And look at here, from 53 to 29%, we're talking about a 24, 25% difference. And same here, 24% uh, difference. So this is something that makes a massive difference in someone's life. So now we have to discuss the paradigm shift. So this is what we need to do. We need to realize that stroke, if it's an LVO or large vessel occlusion, there's a big clot in a big artery, these patients should get TPA and go to the neuro IR suite right away. Just like an ST elevation MI goes to the cath lab. Okay? We know non-ST elevation MIs go for medical treatment and non-large vessel occlusions go to just TPA. So how can we tell if there's a large vessel occlusion? Well, you can get a CT angiogram, but do you delay getting a CT angiogram and going to the endovascular suite by getting a CT, giving TPA, waiting an hour, going back for CTA. No, I think there has to be a way to identify these patients early, which is what VAN does. Identifies these patients early so you can get a CT, CT angiogram right away, activate the neuro IR team, give TPA as you're going up to the endovascular suite. So this is the old model, which is seen throughout the country and throughout the world. You get a CT of head, they come in at 20 minutes, TPA decision within 45 minutes, maybe a half hour. Uh, you, you start the IV TPA, they go back to CTA 60 minutes, they wait for, the, for it to be processed in the read. So you, they call neuro IR around 60 to 90 minutes. And best case scenario, you're in, you're in there within 120 minutes. The new model is you do the VAN exam right as they come in. If they're VAN positive, you do CT, CTA of head 
at 20 minutes and page neuro IR or transfer center right at the same time. You still give TPA at a half hour to 45 minutes, so that doesn't that shouldn't be slowed down at all. Um, uh, the only thing that might take time is perfusion imaging, but we're only advocate, adver, um, advocating for CT angiogram. If it takes less than 10 minutes, then we just give the TPA and we um, put in the 20 gauge later. And then your goal is to be to the neuro IR suite or the transfer process within 60 minutes. This is just going over things that we in our community need uh, to become a comprehensive stroke center. It just tells you that doing stroke is not just about pulling out clots. It's about having biplane rooms. It's about having a neuro ICU with dedicated neurointensivists. It's about having neurosurgery uh, backup. It's about uh, keeping outcomes and data collection. Guess what? You want to do it? Show me your outcomes, right? Um, in addition to that, uh, you should offer things like research as well. So we're advocating for these things to be done in comprehensive stroke centers in order to offer patients the best outcome because we know patients have better outcomes with neuro ICUs. We know you need neurosurgical backup in, in case any complications happen. We know you need neurointervention 24-7. We need consistent care. So this is our model. Anyone with an NI stroke scale of greater than or equal to 6 or we're using VAN more now or they have cortical symptoms, which is what VAN is, visual disturbances, aphasia, or neglect. They automatically page neuro IR and stroke. And instead of just a CT of head, we get a CT angiogram of head and neck with the CT of head. So we're basically, instead of making the TPA decision, then going back to CTA, then calling neuro IR, we do it all at the same time. This is the same thing, everyone up to six hours, but wake up or unknown time of onset right? Because unknown time of onset could have been only an hour. Wake up, it, he could have, the stroke could have happened at six in the morning. He woke up at seven and it's only an hour in. So it's very important. Unknown time and wake up should activate the stroke team and um, perform a van exam and an NIH stroke scale to see uh, what, if the patient is eligible for um, some other treatment besides TPA. Who needs to go di directly to a facility with interventional stroke capability? I'm thinking someone who's VAN positive, or if your area uses the RACE score, or LEG score, or Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Severity score. But I feel VAN is easy. You don't have to calculate any numbers, and it's a yes or no. And uh, we've used this, and for us it's worked uh, just as well as these uh, other screening forms and we feel it is uh, easier and we feel currently it is more accurate but we're collecting more data. So perform fast as usual and, and a van to get a fast van to stroke care. So let's look at the anatomy of van. Look at brain maps. In general brains of mammals and spinal cord are arranged in the same way and we'll see this um, in that all sensory is towards the back, hence the dorsal column uh, of the spine is where the sensory is, and the motor is towards the front. Well, the brain is like that as well. So the frontal lobe and has the premotor area, um, and then the motor strip is in front of the sensory. We know that vision is in the back of the brain. We know that hearing is in the back on the sides of the temporal. So that is the basic uh, con configuration of the brain. We know that patients that have a ma major stroke on the right side have neglect. Patients that have a left-sided stroke, they usually have aphasia because that's where the language is. Um, another thing that's important about Van, gaze preference, we put this under neglect. I know it's a pseudo-neglect, but it's, um, it's also a, a, a way to see if there is a large vessel occlusion. Then we also go over the anatomy of why motor uh, testing is central to everything that, that we do. So right here, so here is the motor strip. It's right in the middle of the brain. 
So think about it this way. There's an artery here that goes to the frontal gaze center. There's an artery here that goes to Broca's or an expressive aphasia, inability to talk. The one in the middle goes to motor, then goes to neglect, then hearing and understanding. This is the inability to hear or understand. And then vision back here. And you know, if there's one big artery that supplies all this, what's in the middle? The motor. So vision's back here. Aphasia, ability to make words right here, and the ability to understand are right here. Neglect is both the neglect classic sense, but also in gaze preference. So this is the hom homunculus. So this is the motor and sensory cortex. And you can see the leg is very small and very distant from where the artery comes up. The artery comes up around here, right? That's why we chose arm, because it's in between the face and in between the leg. And sometimes if someone only has a facial weakness, do you really want to take the 5 to 10% risk of a brain bleed with endovascular treatment? Only if someone has arm and leg involvement do you want to take that risk. Of course, there are exceptions including a severe aphasia. But, you know, generally you want some motor weakness. This is just another brain map showing us the same thing, the motor tex, uh, cortex, the primary sensory cortex. And here it says Wernicke's area interprets a spoken and written language. Again, interpretation, input is towards the back, Output and motor and thinking is towards the front. Broca's area. This affects fluent speech. All right. This is another way to look at it. All these arteries. You see that? If it's one big artery, motor cortex is, is, is in the middle. So let's talk briefly about large vessel stroke versus small vessel stroke. So locational vessel is important, right? So small vessel occlusions are these tiny little arteries right here. So either from high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, or aging, or small little distal clots, okay? These are small vessel occlusions, and the ones in small penetrating arteries are usually what's called lacunas, and these are distal small vessel occlusions. So how do you know these symptoms? How do you know these from the symptoms? They usually don't have many cortical symptoms or just one cortical symptom, right? So one artery, so you'll have one cortical symptom. As soon as you have two cortical symptoms, then you know the clot is here, proximally, which is what Van does. It looks for, look, there's one division here, one division here. It looks for clots here, here, in the carotid terminus ICA, the middle cerebral artery, or even the basilar, right? Because then you're getting multiple branches. How do you know? You have more than one cortical symptom. What are cortical symptoms? Loss of vision, you can't see anything towards one side. Aphasia, inability to understand speech or to produce speech. Or neglect, your eyes are forced over and you're neglecting part of, of, of the world. Okay, so this is a case example. You see this patient right here, the right side of the brain, sorry, the left side of the brain controls the right side. See, he has a right facial group, you see right here. This, he's able to smile here, but not on this side. So what is it? He actually has no flow over here. So this is the artery, which goes underneath, right? Then there should be another artery here, the anterior cerebral towards the front and the middle, all right? And this same thing, we just talked about this, right? This is where the clot is, all right? So small vessel, lacuna versus large artery. Lacunar usually is pure motor or pure sensory, so they don't have cortical uh, symptoms. They don't have an aphasia. They don't have visual field cut, meaning they can't see anything towards the left or anything towards the right. And they don't have neglect where their gaze is forced over or they're ignoring one side of the world. Large artery usually has cortical symptoms. Okay, This is simplified, but for practical purposes, it is a good heuristic. There are subcortical aphasias, you can get visual field cuts from some small artery strokes, but this is a heuristic to identifying these massive strokes right away. So why can you get all this weakness, face, arm, leg, and still not have a large artery stroke? Well, if you look at it, 
our spinal cord is the size of a what? Of a um, a quarter or a or a uh, or a nickel, right? What? How could that be when our brain is so big? And here it says that the leg and arm and face take up half the brain like this on the side. What happens is all these come together into a small little bundle, right? It's called the internal capsule. Look how small that is. If you have a tiny stroke here, you can take out your face, arm, and leg. And this is shown right here as well. And here it comes down, all this big um, capsule. So all this half of the brain comes down to a small little thing and goes all the way across the brain stem crosses in the pons and goes into your spinal cord. So you can have any of these lacuna in the pons, midbrain, thalamus, internal capsule. All these can give you face, arm, and leg complete paralysis with a very small stroke. Again, small artery strokes, how do you tell? They're usually pure motor or pure sensory with no cortical symptoms. Now let's review the functional anatomy of the brain and compare VAN versus other large artery screening tools, right? Because now I've kind of gave you the basics of what the difference between large artery and small vessel stroke is. So now we know, right, motor weakness is used in almost all of the large vessel screening tools due to its central location as well as its link to functional independence on the modified Rankine scale. This modified Rankine scale was used for all five endovascular stroke trials. So technically, having this type of weakness can predict, in a sense, if taking the stroke, the clot out, and giving you the ability to move again will make a difference in your functional outcome. Right? So let's take a look. The first one is race, rapid assessment of occlusion of emergent large vessel um, artery, right? And so this race score test all of these, face, arm, leg, neglect, and inability to understand or talk, basically aphasia, and, and vision and gaze preference. But it's a relatively long exam. Look at this. You test face, and you have to score 0, 1, or 2. You test arm, then you score 0, 1, or 2. You test leg, then you score 0, 1, or 2. You look at their head and their gaze deviation. You, you test aphasia, you have them ask to, to do both tasks cor correctly, perform one task, one or two, um, and then you have to tell, okay, is it the right side is weak or is it the left side is weak? You see how this scoring system, someone can probably say one, someone can say two in all of these. And so the inter-observer reliability of this has to be questioned. In addition to this, now I went over pure lacunar syndromes, right? So you can have here, it says above five, right? You can have a 1 here, 2, 2. It's a 5. This would tell you it's a large artery stroke. But guess what? 30, 40% of the time, it's not. It's a lacunar stroke. Only face, arm, and leg, right? So these are some of the uh, things that we have to be concerned about. Legs, it's a similar one, but they don't test face or arm, and they neglect ne neglect. Same thing, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And they only test the leg which to me doesn't make sense. It's the furthest things out, right? You can miss lots of small NIH, but large vessel occlusions, which can go on in the next 24 hours to become larger. So the use of leg only without the face and arm, it's so distal, you know, not always the, the, the best, but again, you have to calculate numbers, right? Calculate, right? And... Um, so, um, and again, it has a pre pretty good ability, you know, it's sensitivity 69%, positive predictive value about 60, which is better than the positive predictive value of race, which was only 42%, all right? So the LA motor scale, well, neglects all cortical symptoms. It's just a motor scale, right? We talked about why this is uh, not very smart due to all the lacunar strokes that present with pure motor s symptoms. Again, and even this simple skill has you actually count all the numbers up. Oh yeah, if it's greater than then, then it has an 89% sensi sensitivity and 89% speci specificity for large artery clot. But you have to score a lot. And on top of this, 
they don't tell you what the positive predictive value is. Hemiparesis, same problems. Cincinnati Pre Hospital Stroke Severity Scale, similar. They neglect, neglect, and don't test vision, you know. But same with the other ones, scoring as well. Mm -hmm. And only 40% specific. Three items uh, uh, stroke scale, similar, neglects lots of the aphasia, the neglect, the vision. Again, still makes you calculate scores. So VAN. So VAN tests all this, but you never have to calculate a score. And guess what? Just like all the pure motor ones, we put motor in the middle. It's the first thing we do. We have you put up the arm for 10 seconds. If you have zero weakness, you're done. You're done with the exam within 15 seconds. You don't have to do the entire exam like all of these and calculate numbers, right? But then we never, but we don't neglect anything. We don't neglect any cortical symptoms, right? So let's compare race, legs, lamb, CPSS, and van, right? Test cortical symptoms, yes we do. These other ones do as well, right? This is a pure motor one, so it doesn't. No need to calculate score, that's us. Everyone else has to. No need to test severity, that's only us. Everyone else has to. Does, do we, uh, does not test one MCA branch multiple times? They all do, because they test face and arm, or face, arm, and leg, right? They're, right? Has online forms, we do. You can download our forms. Has website and teaching videos. None for the others. So why then? We just went over this. No calculation of numerical score. Uses motor weakness as central point to triage. Uses cortical symptoms without severity and scoring, which actually allows for better inter-observer reliability. Then teaches what cortical symptoms are. I just taught you over this last lecture. The mnemonic helps. Then, oh yeah, vision, aphasia, neglect, Dr. Tal went over this, right? And does not over-test one division of the MCA by testing face and arm and leg, or face, arm, leg, and hand, right? So it, for us, we've had six patients with NIHO skills of greater than 10, all turned out to be lacunar, all van negative, because they were pure motor or and sensory with no cortical symptoms. And so that's why it's powerful. It's in a sense the simplest and the best, all in one. Conducting VAN properly, weakness is the essential question. Why? It's the middle branch of the MCA. It affects disability scales and outcomes for independence. It warrants the risk of endovascular treatment because there is permanent motor weakness. So that's the first thing we do. We have you put up both arms and hold them up for 10 seconds with palms up. And you can refer to our video on how to do this, right? But we have you mark how severe it is, but we don't score it. If you have any weakness at all, then you go on to do the vision, aphasia, and neglect. If patient shows no weakness, patient is van negative. We put this for our ED physicians. And because people around the country and the world miss basal arteries. Someone has confused or comatose with dizziness and focal findings. You know, these are patients you should consider basal artery thrombus and do a CTA. But I'm talking about awake patients that show no weakness and they're van negative, right? So that's the first thing. If they have no weakness, you're done. If they have weakness, then you test the visual fields. We test the four quadrants, okay? And then we have you uh, um, have them look toward the right, towards the left, and just see if their eyes are uneven to pick up a double vision. I picked up two top of the basilar strokes with a minor weakness and, and basically... Uh, a double vision, their, their, their eyes were disconjugate from the VAN exam, okay? Then you test for aphasia. We all know how to do this. I never count slurring of words because that can happen from a pure motor weakness. If somebody is talking like this but he's able to talk, guess what? He's either drunk or has a pure motor weakness, okay? I'm talking to you. I'm understanding you. So the first thing we do, repeat two objects. I usually use my watch and a pen. Then I have you follow two commands. Close your eyes and make a fist. And then I have you repeat something, okay? Today is a sunny day. 
If you can't do any of these, then I mark which one it is and say you're positive for aphasia. Anytime you have a weakness plus aphasia or weakness plus vision loss, you're automatically VAM positive. You don't have to be vision positive, aphasia positive and negative and uh, neglect positive. Anything with motor weakness, you're automatically VAM positive. So if you have motor weakness plus vision loss, you're VAM positive. Motor weakness plus aphasia, you're VAM positive. Motor weakness plus neck, you're VAM positive. Neglect, so you just look at the person, do they have forced gaze to one side or they have the inability to go past midline? So if you're standing on the left, can they not go look past the midline? Or if they're standing on the right, they can't uh, uh, look towards you, okay? And then you have to touch the right hand, then the left hand, then both hands at the same time with their eyes closed. If they tell you when you touch both hands, you're, they're only feeling the right or only feeling the left, that means they're neglecting you touching both sides. And that's the entire Van exam. So what's next? Well, let's look at some neurointerventional results. This is someone, and you see how fast we're becoming. 148, you see there's no blood flow to half the brain here. There's a big clot right here. 148 is when we started. You have bypass flow at 59, so within 48 to 59, 11 minutes. You have complete recanalization by 06. 18 minutes, complete recanalization. Look at this. There was no arteries here before. And this was January 6th. January 5th, same, same thing, right? You see no flow on this side. 27 after. 38. Again, within 11 minutes, we have bypass flow. For stint retriever, by, by 45, we're done. 27 to 45, 18 minutes again. January 5th, January 6th was the other one. Just December 30th was the one before that, right? 11.06. This is why you should use a five plane machine. Because if you have this flow straight ahead, Half hour, most cases are less less than a half hour. December 20th, again, why it's so important to have a, a biplane so you can see this. Complete recanalization. Here we go. Despite the fact that she has in, intracranial athro everywhere, Stint retrievers still work very nice. And again, these are non-randomized cases. You can see this is just within one month. That is it. Please feel free to contact us about uh, van, vision, aphasia, ne neglect, large artery stroke, large vessel occlusion screening. We appreciate you coming to our site, taking the time to learn why we're doing this exam and how it makes a big difference in patients' outcomes and seeing how effective we can pull out clots now. We're at 95% Tiki 2B 
or uh, TIKI 3, which is complete recanalization or greater than 50% recanalization to brain tissue. And um, the outcomes of stroke are becoming better and better, especially for these massive strokes. Thank you so much, and please feel free to uh, contact us with any questions or concerns.